Hello, puppies and kids. Welcome to another episode of Blasphemer's Bible. We're doing it at a different time today because I have a special thing that I have to go to. I'm taking a dog to a new owner in like seven hours from here. And so I'm going to be on a road trip tomorrow that uh, that will carry over into the next day. And so there will have to be another, I'll be in Springfield, Missouri, doing another snake appreciation day, as Tomer likes to call it. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody to, on this team for, for wanting to do it at this weird time. Though I don't think we're ever going to do it at this weird time again, because we don't, we don't have our usual audience here. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are probably stuck at work and can't join us there. So we, we will be shooting for more Saturdays the regular time we do this. I also want to re open with a uh, super chat. Uh, we have Mark Smith, who uh, posted $5 and said, Sadly, I will be at work when this airs. Here's a fiver to show my support. Aww. I will catch this after the fact. You guys are great. Thank Aww. you very much for that. Indeed. Indeed. Anybody have any opening comments? Oh, we are on to the slavery. This is going to be so much fun. So now we get to wade through the first version of the excuses Christians will give you for Christian slavery and what? how it's not really slavery. And that's going to be so much fun. I can't wait. I'm not drinking at all. Wow. Did you guys hear that? Lilith just said slavery was fun. Cancel Lilith. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I also said I wasn't drinking. Consensual <laughs> slavery can be fun to some people. <laughs> well, maybe she was referring to herself as her, her time as a slave. That's what it is. Of course. Drinking. Yeah. Uh, so idea. this. Uh, this. Wait, section... wait, Lilandra, your microphone is slow. Okay. Drinking mm -hmm. sounds like a good idea for this chapter. But yes, but I, I'm a little confused. We just read the Ten Commandments in the previous chapter. That's when it ends, right? I mean, it, <laughs> it, we have the ten, well, and then see, we're done. No, you see, <laughs> you forgot the rest of them. Like uh, more than half of them jerking off. So uh, he he couldn't include little things like people aren't property or anything like that. You know, more fun. Well, I, I I would say that is um bit more nuanced than that um and i i unfortunately didn't really go into depth when it comes to this part uh on the notes that i wrote for this i did however um wrote something on the discord regarding uh slavery in uh mesopotamia and ancient israel i will refer to you to um an article and a book uh, the article is called the anthropology of slavery in the covenant code by victor h matthews and the book is the Dead Slavery in Israel and the Ancient Near East by Gregory C. Chilichigno. Yes, and I suppose we can give the ancient Jews this, that this was not chattel slavery on the level of Christian slavery, which I remind you all is what the, uh, the triangular trade was. It was Christian slavery of African peoples justified by Christianity entirely for the majority of its existence. Um, this is, well, to say it's not quite that bad is not exactly a high bar, but uh, good job. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's kind of wild how uh, they, they, how they spun biblical text to justify that as well. Like the the mark of Cain for that period of time Ugh, was thought yeah. to be uh, oh dark skin, so and the curse of uh, Ham. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Just the same thing apparently, or not, or which. No, I mean they're they're, they're different things, but the um, but yeah, the the justifications they had was just uh, I mean even biblically speaking they were unfounded justifications, but uh, when it comes to this slavery, yeah, it's certainly not the same as antebellum slavery. Yeah. But uh, um, it's still slavery, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I even have a quote by Matthews. It's, it's a short one, but I'm still going to read it. Despite the increased numbers of person taken in warfare, the idea of permanent chattel status on the North American model, uh, circa 17th to 19th century CE, was unknown in the ancient Near East. Rather, those persons who survived the transition from freedom to slavery were generally returned to semi-free, serf status, a more productive condition since it included payment of tax and was more conductive to establishing a family. Yay, they get to be peasants. Yay. Well, <laughs> some of them, again, uh, some of them. 
it's mm-hmm. it's important to note, and we will, I'm going to ask anyone who's actually following along in their Bible to put a sticky note at Exodus 21, because there will be other laws about slavery later. And this specifically regards only the treatment of Hebrew slaves. It has nothing to do with all the people you took in battle. And there are very explicit directions regarding them that are entirely different that a lot of Christians trying to defend biblical slavery will absolutely deny exists. So make a note, we will be referencing. Yeah, yeah. Right. if slavery so, comes up more than once, and so don't place everything on this chapter, because this chapter doesn't deal with the West. No, no, it does not. Okay, I, I if you don't mind, I well, I've, actually, I've got a couple of chats to read already. Yeah. Uh, Mojo says, I am religious. Would you have a problem with it? Or is it based on religion imposed to others? I'm, do Wait, anybody I else want to interpret that question? Because I don't get it. What? I, I think he's saying being religious. Part of his... I oh, think maybe it says, no, I, I don't get it. I am religious. Do you have a problem you have with a problem him with? being religious? Or do you only have a problem with religion being imposed on others? Uh, well, I, I would have a problem with anybody who believes something that isn't true. I mean, if somebody told me that Benjamin Franklin was the first president of the United States, I would correct them. <laughs> and then that person would might maybe argue that I have a right to believe that, that Benjamin Franklin is the first president. I'm like, and, okay, but um, just trying to help you out there, dude. So, uh, yeah, I would have a problem with religious belief, but not so much as when it is imposed on others. Now, I have to believe that Benjamin Franklin was the first president or you're going to burn me at the stake. Got it. I, I'll just reiterate what I said before. Uh, if you perform your religion only behind closed doors among consenting adults, I have nothing to say because what happens between consenting adults behind closed doors is none of my business. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, happy Pride Month. Yes, happy Pride Month. <laughs> oh, now you've only, damned us all. Is now, now all of our redneck No, no, it's, only, it's also in Israel <laughs> as well. There is yeah, month. June is Pride Month everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like in England it's July, but maybe. maybe there are sort of other Pride, Pride Months, but July. I think this one is based on the Stonewall Riots, which I would like to remark was started by a black trans woman throwing a brick at the corrupt cops, so... Yeah, well, now that Lawrence has said that, Kid Rock won't be watching us anymore. Oh, oh no. no. He doesn't want to be happy and gay. <laughs> All right, now Minute Rice offers $6.66 and says, sending along some encouragement, our honor, encouragement honoring our Lord and Savior, Satan. You're going to need it to get through this shit. Remember Pride Month, if you take the end of Pride and the beginning of month, you get a demon. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, and, and Tomer, pay attention to how I pronounce this, which I think is French. It is French, yes. It's, uh, okay. it's I think Stessy it's painted past, by... Sorry. Paz une pipe. <laughs> oh, that's great. Ceci, I think it's pronounced <laughs> Ceci ne pas une pipe. Une, yeah, une pipe. It's a, it's a painting by, I think... Um, it's it's un um, peep. No. It's un peep. Yeah. Un peep. Yeah. Un it's, peep. Uh, un it's, peep. An art, it's by an artist. I forgot who is the name of him. Um, so, Parles Vu's Frank Hayes, Madame Moiselli's? Vanem Agrit. Wow. His name was Vanem Agrit. Yeah. <laughs> Vanem Agrit. That was his name. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, so you, the, the you have it was, um, what? Yeah, you have you haven't read the comment what? yet. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh yeah. yes, the comment. How and why is Christianity a danger to society that needs to be stopped? So well, we because have they. A topic. Yeah. Sorry. So we, because they, they they kind of own and control everything at every level of federal government, state and you know, state and federal, and so um, that's a problem. Uh, they are targeting trans people. They're targeting women's reproductive rights. They're targeting freedom of religion. They are trying to deprive us of our human rights because that's what religious theocracies always do. They want to undermine and overturn the Constitution. They want to establish Christian nationalism, not just as, as a national religion so that nobody else has any religious rights, and, but they also want to make that the form of government so that uh, we will have a nation that, that enforces Levitical law, and that means killing anybody who works on weekends. Yeah, the, uh, the, we, we're kind of 
lucky in a sense that like your average everyday Christians don't really, uh, they're not really pushing for that kind of thing at least. But uh, it, it is it is a problem when it gets to, to that high level. And if, if someone is just like, you know, they're going to their services, they're praying, whatever, and they're not, you know, imposing their beliefs on the on the public uh, it, it's not really harmful so like i don't really care uh as long as it doesn't you know affect me or uh anyone who doesn't want to be affected by it but uh, yeah once you get to those to those levels of uh to that level of government and you try putting you know either religious doctrine in public schools like with the ten commandments or when I think it was also in Texas where they tried to make uh, Moses a uh, founding father too, which by the way, the, 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 I, I was talking uh, to my creationist friend on campus and he was like, that is horrible. Like he knew it was awful because he's yes. like, he is just a, he is a genuinely good person. Uh, and he's also, he's also a creationist. So he's not exactly the brightest, but he, uh, he, but the thing is he, he doesn't, um, he still has like his form of Christianity isn't harmful because he doesn't want to have it imposed on others. He agrees with freedom of religion. He thinks it's a great idea. Uh, and then he, he wants to, you know, keep the separation of church and state and like that kind of Christianity. I, that doesn't bother me. That's why him and I get along. I, I'd like to propose a slightly different perspective based a little bit more on something Christopher Hitchens propounded which is that the, the idolization and worship we give to faith is the problem because nations around the world are able to circumvent the UN code of human rights because such and such conflicts with their faith. And we all stop asking questions when that happens as not necessarily as individuals here, but collectively people will back off from things they would never back off from. And what that ultimately means throughout the world is the violation of human rights on every level. And people look askance or don't look directly because it's under the cloak of a faith. And what that literally means is that today and tomorrow and every day for the rest of your life, a child will die in terror and agony, completely unnecessarily of something someone did because everybody else hear that barely yeah i barely I heard that uh, at the end that. i didn't really hear her yeah um, and, I, and it, I could tell that there was a great deal of gravity behind what she was saying and right at the point where it got important it was muffled can you hear um, me now yes, yes yeah clearly excellent i just turned up my mic what um, i said I wanted... no no go on sorry what I said was that because we treat faith with kid gloves, because we allow things to happen that we would not if justified by literally anything else in the universe, it means that across the world, more and more people enforce their faith and violate human rights. And that ultimately what that means is that tonight and tomorrow night and every night for the rest of your life, a child is going to die in terror and agony, completely unnecessarily, because of something someone believed that someone else wasn't willing to question. I just want to make a quick a quick note. I'm seeing the comments piling up, and if we like have a five minutes uh, answer to each one of them, we'll never get to the Bible. So I I I, I suggest we read them quickly or answer them quickly. Yeah. So Jeff afterwards offers $10 and says, I'm looking forward to this discussion and how anyone can defend it as moral, like ever, like seriously, ever. Yeah. And then Arthur Her Hubert says, hi, coming from France with a Catholic education, I recently noticed that American religious sermon use, uh, sermon use emotion much more than Catholic one. Do you think it is why it is more popular? I'm sure that is. You know, I mean, I mean the, 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 I've been to a Catholic church it's like the end of Rosemary's Baby. It's it it's where they're all chanting in Latin and it's horrific. It's creepy. 
And then you go to like the black church and there's like, wow, that's that, that they're animated, <laughs> you know, the music, the dancing, the passion, all of that. Or maybe I was just watching the blues brothers, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's it. And then Miski Ferry says, uh, any suggestions for how should months named after the other deadly sins be celebrated? I'd love to see a wrath month for for instance. <laughs> okay. And a gluttony month. I'm down for that one. Yes. Then is it every month, month, another month. month. You'll have to add I mean, another sins then. If you have seven, you'll have to add uh, five more. I think I can do it. Blasphemy. Uh, well, well, uh, masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, I, I think last... masturbation is in the last category. But we okay. can devote the entire month to blasphemy. Um, okay. Uh, it, 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 let's move on. All right. Trevor and Wright says, can you believe we have to debate slavery in the Bible, even while some still believe that slavery is justified in Christianity? Well, that's just sad. Yeah, I actually heard a Republican politician argue a few months ago, maybe a year ago now, uh, but that he wanted to reinstate slavery. Yeah, not even kidding. He can wear the then, chains first. Yeah. Sean C. offers $10, says, watching from work. $10 to please never butcher the French language again, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if we need anybody to speak French, it will be Tomer. Oh, no. Maybe. <laughs> Me no speak French. Wait, Lilith, you're, you're in Canada, right? So, like, si, how much French do you know? No, si. no, 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 just because I can pronounce it better than Aaron, which admittedly, yeah, you're you're making it pretty easy. Um, I can mostly actually sing in French. I, I did uh, sing classically for several years, which means that I can, um, oddly enough, being a mezzo soprano, probably make love to a woman in French, but I can't actually order a coffee or go to the bathroom, uh, which are usually far more immediate concerns. So... <laughs> Yeah, these, sorry. I'm sorry. My, I'm just still languages. lost at make what make love to a woman in French. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm going to stop drop drop the visuals. I'm going to move on to the next comment. Sean C. Ten dollars. Wait, wait. I read that one. And then the Mighty Chicken. He sounds like someone I know. Mighty Chicken. <laughs> I have a student who is struggling with meaning in life. He gave me a fantastic note asking what meaning was. They're asking what mean means. I guess that's what the definition of is is. Uh, yeah, I told him what you once said to me, find meaning in giving meaning to someone else. Oh. I, should, I should have read the whole thing before cutting in with a joke. Thank you very much for that, Mighty Chicken. All right, so that was that was the comments. If you don't mind, I'm going to open up the reading. I want to start. Anybody else can jump in after this, but give me yeah, the beginning. Read, at, read uh, up to 11. Up to 11. Ah. I'll turn it up to 11. And God said, now these are the rules that you shall set before them. And then God leaned back and stroked his beard and stared <laughs> off into space for a moment to try to think of what would be the most important thing to start with. Mm. And then he got it. When you buy a Hebrew slave, <laughs> he shall serve six years. In the seventh, he shall go free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free, then his master shall bring him to God. And he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall be his slave forever. All we have to do is hold your children, your whole family ransom. That's it. Say you love the slave master. You love your wife. You love your children. You must love the slave master. Ah, you want to keep your kids? You want to keep your wife? Then you stay with me. See how easy that is? This is what we call morality in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I'm reading a different version than the rest no, of the No, it's fine. It's this, I have to interject <laughs> because I'm having flashbacks. 
<laughs> I'm having flashbacks to Colonel Ingersoll, who said that he wanted it written in the book, if there is any God, he wanted it written in the book of his eternal remembrance that he denied this for him, that he denied that God ever made the loving, tearful arms of wife and babe shackles to enslave a man for life. Uh, Aaron, keep going, please. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, what, you can sell your daughter as a slave? Yeah. When a man sells his daughter, as a slave, that's fine. I'm a god. I'm moral. I'm going to permit that shit. She shall not go out as the male slaves do. <laughs> Equal rights, huh? If she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. In other words, you bought it, you know, you, you broke it, you bought it, and she's not going to be any good for anybody else. So there you're stuck. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. If he takes another wife for himself, he shall not diminish her food or clothing or her marital rights. You got to keep that maintenance up. And if he does not do these things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. To wander so, the world penniless. If he doesn't, if he doesn't honor his commitment to her, that he can kick her out with nothing, alone in the wilderness. In a world where um, only virgins have value. Yeah, I think they you should, have sons. I think the the appropriate way to understand this is through the historical context, because there. There is like a reasoning behind this, but I won't say it's like a moral reasoning. It's more of a economic one. And I'm saying this delightfully because Pragmatic. I'm not saying that this is good. I'm just saying that in that time, it was acceptable. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the main reason. But God is unchanging. Context. God is the source of morality. To be this clear, is was God's all, was opportunity. Also... It was also what? acceptable in the New Testament, too, so it's not like much changed. But uh, what I'm really wondering is, uh, so Isaac and or Tomer, uh, the, the translation here of uh, it's both at the uh, in verse seven and at the beginning of verse two. So the translation that we just read was uh, when. Right. But uh, I've heard it variously translated, you know, when. If and uh, in uh, Alter's version it says, should you buy a Hebrew slave? So it's not like you know it th doesn't just assume that you will, right? And I, I have heard this as a a criticism, uh, but I have so from the translation of the the Masoretic at least uh, from Alter it says, should you buy a Hebrew slave instead of when you do, uh, and same with uh, verse seven there. And I checked the. Uh, the Septuagint as well, and that one is also a uh, circumstance. That one's also circumstantial. Uh, use the word aeon, so uh, it is. It's not about when. It's about like if you do it. Uh, even though you know, it's not translated as if, but, it, but I, I, I can trump you all about that because you know what you're saying right now. I'm re I'm reading the English Standard Version. I'm sorry, I thought I was still reading the God's Word Version. I'm not. I'm right. reading the English Standard. <laughs> I figured it oh, out. Oh, in I my it out. you switched because it uses the word slave instead of servant. in my NIV yep. it says you. servant, even mm. though it literally says he will be his servant well, for life. So. Well, it can. It can be translated as a servant. I mean, the servant songs in Isaiah are evid, are also used there, the word for slave, evid. And I think BDB, BDB Dictionary also translates either slave or servant. Yeah. But yeah, I was, I was going to start out with the God's Word version just because it's God's Word. Because you know, Isn't that uh, people some were. Some hippie version. <laughs> Yeah, and and a quick heads up for P-Town. In your Bible, it says bondsman, which is Old English for slave. It does say slave in your Bible as well. Let me check again. Yeah. Um, so to answer yeah. um, Lawrence's question, the the word that is in the beginning is ki. Now, this word, in at least in modern Hebrew, means because. But in this context, it 
doesn't really make sense. So, so I read I read this key as if if you will buy a slave you, because you see this the keyword uh, several times uh, in the Bible. If you will do this, if you will do that, and BDB dictionary also yeah. says that for when um, mobile identical blah blah blah. So I personally see it as if, uh, but you could also read it as um, that or for or when. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's, it's, the, 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 when... it's a very minute difference, but I would not read it as I sh actually I don't think it should be uh, read as when uh, because oh. it's also important to realize um, that because uh, when carries an assumption with it, but mm -hmm. it is it's a small it's a minute difference. But the the thing that I want to point out is this section that we're in this we're get, actually getting into the covenant code proper because the Ten Commandments. This is the covenant code. Yeah, I. I know, but <laughs> when I said the covenant code proper, uh, like sometimes the, um, you know, the Ten Commandments are included, but textually speaking, uh, they wouldn't would not have been included. So I noted how the version that we read of the Ten Commandments uh, mm -hmm. here, like the first one in Exodus 20, is based off of the version in Deuteronomy. Yeah. This section, however, that we're getting into these next few chapters, uh, this would have been uh, in... I don't know if it would have been sometime in between the two, or maybe it is even perhaps older than the version in Deuteronomy. A scholarship is, is variously, um, that they've been debating it for a while. Like mm. uh, uh, Van Setters dates it uh, later, Collins dates it earlier. So the, so the issue is we're dealing with a different strand here. We're de dealing with a different strand of text. So this this section is not to be interpreted morally like uh, the one previously, because the one previously came with a theophany, which is the important part. This part would have not initially come with a theophany, so it would have been strict legal codes. Uh, so it's not to be interpreted morally, but legally. And the the addition of the theophany in uh, chapter 19 would have given it that kind of divine uh, divine legitimation. Right. Uh, and we did both of us, Lawrence, point out that the uh, the Ten Commandments was an insert into the original text here where they wanted to to put it at first priority, quite understandable, but then reading into an existing. And this is where I think uh, the documentary hypothesis, as much as I realize scholarship has expanded quite beyond that in many cases, might be useful to people here to see that like, from chapter 20, verse 18, all the way through chapter 24, most of chapter 24 at least, is considered the E source, the Elohist source, which would be an early Northern Israel um, source. Again, that's very general, does not specify when in that timeline. Also, certain points in that will be debated, but largely that is a coherent chunk that is quite early. So, again, that breakdown being somewhat more simple than the level that you're used to operating at, I think might be useful for people. But that is, again, this would be the law of the Northern Kingdom of Israel initially, potentially, or at least from their writings. And then, you know, was woven into the Pentateuch as a more coherent thing. And yeah, the, as we both pointed out, the Ten Commandments was, you know, co-opted in, oh. inserted. Oh, yeah. oh, there we go. Hello? Yeah. It's yeah. working again. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it was just, you know, Ten Commandments were important. So we stuck them at the beginning because fancy. I Fair wanted enough. to um, pick up on the point Lawrence was making that the New Testament condones slavery also. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the Ephesians, uh, which is Paul, you know, mm -hmm. servants, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with a good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So the, uh, serve your slave master like you would Christ. 
because yeah. that's that's yeah. there's a heavenly command to do this and like uh there was a custom uh the Ro romans uh if a roman soldier passed you on the road and he went and he wanted you to carry his armor uh the 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 saying go the extra mile comes from the bible like uh -huh. he could command you to carry it a mile but go an extra mile so compelled labor is not a problem in in the in the new testament either no and it isn't so like a lot, of, a lot of christians i meet they they'll go yeah but that's old testament but yeah, it's true. also a new testament well yeah i mean the thing is it does get a little i don't want to spend uh really that much time on it because the new testament is its own thing uh but they essentially in, in hebrews there's this whole section about uh how the the new covenant supersedes the old covenant so uh there is a textual basis for being like oh the old testament it doesn't uh, apply anymore kind of thing but the uh but the fact is yes uh, it still is in support of uh Slavery, slave. even in Philemon, when a uh, slave uh, Onesimus runs away, he is given back to his uh, uh, to his master. But and the... Paul asks nicely that his friend be set free. But that's not like all slavery is evil. That's just like, but this okay. is a really good guy. Can you make an exception? Yeah, and then there's this whole thing about you know being uh, being a slave to Christ is being free. And then yeah, the, the yeah, yeah the, there there's a there's a good amount of theology behind this uh, in the in the new yeah. testament but and this is leave it for that. why i have a bone to pick with what you're saying about you know a nice christian at your college they're a christian they base their their faith on the bible the bible commands all kinds of evil things and it, it, even if they're not laws um i was saw a study that 30 percent of people have been traumatized by the by christianity and the bible i mean you weren't raised as a christian but can you imagine being told that you were going to hell as a child if you didn't do this or that just hell itself it can be traumatic to some people so it's based on something evil and him being the nice christian there are lots of nice christians i'll testify to that but I, I had a nice Christian co-worker who thought it was, as a teacher, her, her duty to tell people that Christianity was better than the other religions when it's when it, in social studies class. It's nice, 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 like, and it wasn't a law, but she just, they did just feel compelled to impose their beliefs on other people. Um, can, can we do uh, one more um, uh, chat because it's relevant to this discussion, the answer? Okay. Um, the next, like the first one that you haven't done yet. Sorry. Aaron, you're muted. Oh. Thank you. Eric Wander. Uh, so Tom, Aaron, Isaac, at what moment in history did these laws and decrees stop being imposed by the Jews? Like someone must have come out and said, guys, we got to stop doing this. I think Isaac knows more about this. Thing. Yeah. So um, I, I looked into this. Uh, I found it very interesting because uh, like these laws are you know, talked about like, oh, yeah, slavery wasn't as bad or, or like they didn't want to compare it to like modern slavery. But what is interesting is that a lot of the laws that we're going to see in this chapter, in the next few ha chapters, um, the the slave, uh, the laws regarding a, a Hebrew slave and any of like the death penalties and stuff, those were all kind of stopped uh, before the Second Temple was destroyed uh, because the uh, it was on the they were only able to keep these laws when there was like a high court and the high court was actually abolished or sent into exile before the temple was destroyed. So the time of Jesus and the New Testament, there were no uh, Hebrew slaves. It would have only have been, um, I guess, regular standard slaves, uh, which would have been more like chattel slavery where you could own them, um, stuff like that. The only the only like laws about them was you know you had to treat them maybe a bit nicer than the romans were treating their slaves but that would be about it so whenever the new testament is talking about you know servants obey your master it's not talking about hebrew slaves it's talking about non uh, like non-christian even like you know this this uh the the, the slaves to the christians thank you so, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. 
And then Mojo puts in a comment, says, I heard the Bible vowels were added in 900 AD. Is this true? And how could we understand it without vowels? Or where are, were there many Kirats in the Bible or many interpretations? And I don't know how to pronounce that because, I mean, I never read. I think Dune. it's Kirat. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but he, he, say, he says in the next comment that Kirat means how you pronounce the words. Yeah, there were um, a few different ways of doing it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, so Kira, so the yeah. the um uh I should have saved my my dune joke for that one. The the consonantal text uh is uh, would have been of course the, the original uh the, the original. But uh yeah, m medieval uh manuscripts, medieval uh bibles do of course include the the pronunciations there or, or the vowels for pronunciations. But like for example, like the biggest example of this is Yahweh like uh, it would have initially been pronounced Yahweh, but then a certain a certain group of people interpreted uh, it, it as Jehovah. Uh, no, <laughs> Germans. They were Germans. <laughs> yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is. But even that is wrong because it uses the wrong. vowel marks for a different word. Yeah. Yeah. So so it, it that that would have been an example of them being uh, variously understood without those vowel marks yeah yeah um so the masoretic uh pronunciation um a vowel system is a later edition um uh, where it was established the ones that we use today till today was established quite late but there were other uh vowel pointing systems that were not that used different symbols and stuff like that that are older and uh people that spoke hebrew uh commonly would have been able to understand the text without the need for vowels uh through both tradition and uh the understanding of the grammar itself like certain words can only be pronounced in a certain way because of the way that the the grammar laws worked um and also that sometimes even the spelling even though they use a consonantal system only there are certain letters that can kind of represent a consonant and a vowel like as a placeholder so uh for example like um even in english not in english but like in old Latin, uh, the the letter U, uh, U or V would have be, would have both represented a V sound and a U sound. So it was a consonant, but it was started, it was used as a vowel as well. So in Hebrew, the same the the, the letter that represents V or W would have also represented a vowel U or O. So um, if you saw that letter in the middle of a word, you kind of knew what vowel it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, I also want to call context. attention to. The I Sorry, want to call attention ahead. to the idea that you know, people want to say that this is the, the one unchanging God of all time, of all worlds, right? He created every planet everywhere, and, and, and so he created every culture, all of us. You know, this is the one God for everybody for all time. But Jews get special privilege, S special Honestly, laws for Jewish people. Is it not true, Isaac Tomer, that a prayer of the Jewish people has canonically historically been, oh God, in your mercy, pick another people. <laughs> <laughs> I have had many Jewish friends tell me that basically, yeah, being the chosen people is not exactly ideal. So yeah, you have to do 630 commandments while the rest of the Gentiles do seven. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. Trevor and Wright says, if God is morally good, wouldn't the situation regarding slavery be the right time or opportunity to get things right altogether and abolish slavery? Hey, you know, it's I don't think anybody's ever thought of that before. <laughs> there are apologetics that kind of make sense, like how you know God had to do it in a certain way to make it to, to make it logically, economically feasible, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh but my God, I don't find that as interesting. Oh! Because... There's you know, this whole thing from Augustine. It's not godly. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's this whole thing from Augustine about like, well, you know, when you're like a child, you're not being like taught like some a high level like mathematics or anything. Like you, you start off with like you know algebra, and then you go you to should. <laughs> right, <laughs> but but the the argument uh, from Augustine was like, well, in the same way, he couldn't like do that all at once even though yes he easily could have he's god he could have done anything in any way he could have set up the rules in any way we're not in in his world like we 
No. He could have easily made it where it's not like, oh, this, this. There is no <laughs> universe in which I will have your neighbors murder your entire family and you if you pick up sticks on the wrong day is too, is totally reasonable to induce morally, but don't fucking own people is too far and they just aren't there yet. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's it is ridiculous. Yeah, but that that was the argument that Augustine used. There was there were arguments about that about American slavery too along those lines. They're not ready to govern themselves. I think even John Wayne said something like that that during the, the segregation yeah. thing that that yeah. until they're educated yeah. enough, you know. So that's like condescending and notice whenever. Uh, slavery stopped being a universal thing. People started uh, inventing machines to do backbreaking labor. It's, I mean, it's, it, economically, that argument fails on so many levels. It's not as interesting. Arguments. Right. <laughs> who's who's going to pick up reading from here? Um, yeah, no, I, I still haven't Ooh. done my commentary. Yeah, that's by a bit. <laughs> We've only done like the first verse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. We were dedicating to reading the comments. <laughs> so, a couple of things. So usually, <laughs> so usually I give uh, the rabbinic interpretation or the traditional commentators. But but I realized that if I would have done this, my my notes would have been very very long. So what I've done here is, I, I've done two things regarding the, the the covenant code. The first is comparing with uh, the ancient Near Eastern laws. The Hammurabi, he died, Shnuna, etc. And the second is uh, investigating like difficult words in Hebrew. And I'm going to, I've used Sarna quite a lot. I've used it in five times and I probably use him the sixth time because of the mention of the Amma, which I, I haven't included probably because I didn't want it to be six pages. But I, when Aaron said this, I thought this is kind of, this is kind of important. So let me, uh, after this short introduction, let me start. Uh, verse two. So Hammurabi 117 reads, if anyone failed to meet a claim for debt and sell himself, his wife, his son and daughter for money or give them away to forced labor, they shall work for three years in the house of the man who bought them or the proprietor. And in the fourth year, they shall be set free. Oh, yeah. look, another morality was superior to God's morality. <laughs> this is my the, surprise. The number of years is, is shorter. Yes, it's shorter. <laughs> um, and the word free here uh, in Hebrew is chofshi. So Sana comments here, Hebrew chofshi on the basis of its Akkadian cognate chupshu and Ugaritic chepet originally seems to have been a technical term for one who belongs to the low social class composed of emancipated slaves. By a shift of meaning in the Bible, it came to mean simply free. And verse 4, uh, Sarna comments, In the ancient Near East, it was common practice for a master to mate a slave with a foreign bondwoman solely for the purpose of siring houseborn slaves. In such instances, no matrimonial or emotional bond was necessarily involved, and the woman and her offspring remained the property of the master. You know, there are American legal documents uh, on, right about the time that, that uh, Darwin and Lincoln were born. Uh, there was an American legal, in that year, in fact, there was an American legal document that said almost exactly that, that, you know, about about how you own the, the products of your livestock. Oh, my God. You I know? wonder yeah. why. Because, because uh, American slavery was often justified with the Bible. All the time. Yep. Absolutely, all the time. Well, oh, but they're entirely say, different. Biblical slavery is not like American slavery. It's just American slavery quotes the Bible in how every it day in every way it did. Absolutely, but there was um, I cannot remember which founding father said that slavery degrades the master even more than the slave because the slave can theoretically be possessed of every virtue, and the master cannot. Because by being an owner of slaves, he is automatically bereft at some point of virtue. And this kind of law actually undermines that. You have to take 
a wife and beget children and somehow divorce yourself from emotional attachment of that if you ever want your own freedom. This is fucking sick. On a level, I, I there are no words in Elvish, I, Entish, or the tongues of men to describe <laughs> how fucked this is. I wouldn't say that they're, they are uh, in worse shape than the slave, but being a slave master does does make you monstrous and in, and inhumanly that was the point not yeah. that they had a worse condition in any other sense but in the moral sense that their integrity was inherently violated by being the master in a way that the slaves was not is um aren't you want to read the comments or should i continue my commentary yes i'll read the comments phobus sure. says um uh, gotta say, Lilith is killing it this episode. Love her. <laughs> and Minute Rice offers another $5 and says, I think Lilith needs an alcoholic beverage of her choice. She's got one. <laughs> she showed us her reserves. She She's stocked yep. for this show. That is that is one drink right there. <laughs> Don't tempt me, sir. Don't tempt me. And then uh, Charlie Melanie says, oh, of course, uh, they just weren't ready for absolute moral guidance. So God gave them the light edition. <laughs> Where we be, we can be extremely particular about these other things, but slavery? No, 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 no. Sell your children. <laughs> cut the skin sell your children. Cut I want to buy them. <laughs> Make sure you cut the skin off your penis. That's very important. I'm going to repeat that several times in this Bible, but no, I'm never going to say, hey, don't own other people, you know? Yes. And, and, and oh, and you're, you're allowed to take the, the children of, of, of the, the people you murdered, uh, in the towns you raid. Oh, no, just I am the source girl. of all morality. So when you raid a town and kill everyone in it, make sure to kill all the mothers and kill all the little boys, but keep going. Well, that, that's a later chapter. Okay, um, verse 5, Sana again comments, It must have been a fairly frequent occurrence that the slave felt comfortable and at home in his master's household, and also formed an emotional attachment to the bondwoman and to the children he had begotten through her. In addition, he did not relish the prospect of freedom in poverty. These considerations might, have, might lead him voluntarily to surrender his right to personal freedom. In such a case, he had to make a solemn declaration to that effect. Yes, it is possible for men to love their children. Isn't that shocking? Now, verse 6. So first of all, before the judges, Hebrew Bible reads El Ha Elohim, which could be read as uh, before God, like the Vulgate and JPS do. do. Most early translations, the Mechilta and traditional commentators, interpret Elohim to mean judges or to a court. Chacham explains that the judges are called Elohim because they sit next to the temple and the altar, and the Shekhinah is with them. Some scholars interpret the Elohim as referring to temple idols. Professor Meir Malul writes that this could also refer to the house idols, based on the Nuzi texts. These idols were located next to the house door and were used in the family's personal worship. Strangers were prevented from participating in such rituals. If a stranger desired to join the family, it was done in front of these idols. So on on the Elohim thing, so yeah, that has been a very common understanding that Elohim would be judges, uh, but it's not. There is there is like no basis for this. It's it's noted both in Alter's commentary and I believe in uh, like if if we take a look at how Elohim has been used, uh, Samuel, for example was referred to as uh, as Elohim. Like I said, that Elohim uh, came from the ground, right? Uh, the, the etymological understanding of Elohim has always had divine connotations to it. And the fact that they try to retrofit it and use it as judges is just entirely misplaced. There's really no good reason to, to accept that. Uh, the, the idea here is or this probably speaks to closer to its uh, its antiquity than it does uh, than it does anything else because the usage of Elohim back when Elohim did actually mean 
gods, plural, uh, would make more sense here. Uh, so the the note here from Alter, this pre-monotheistic detail may reflect the very old age of the law and the repetitive phrase and make him approach the door or doorpost may well be a somewhat later gloss intended to explain what made him uh, approach the Elohim meant. Uh, the, but yeah, the, the issue here is we're talking about gods. We're not, uh, so it would have originally meant uh, gods and then when the language changed, it would have been interpreted as singular god but that that it does have a very uh long long process of development. So if i'm understanding you correctly what you're saying is that this is was reinterpreted because of henotheism and then monotheism yeah. whereas initially it was the court of the gods because they were originally polytheistic but then it was like hey uh no we totally meant the judges that stand for god and that's totally you know pay atten no attention to the man behind the curtain Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of uh, scholars, uh, for example, David Carr, he believes that this section was actually like ve either very early in, uh, in, yeah, very, either very early in uh, the monarchy or pre-monarchic. And I don't think that can really stand, but it is in fact earlier than the monotheism or the, yeah, the henotheism and, and then subsequent monotheism from the time of Josiah. So the, it's this... difficult to extrapolate exactly when, but it's very interesting to see the yeah. development. Um, now the door or the doorpost. Uh, Sana comments that the door is that of the sanctuary. And this is supported by the Ashnuna law 37, which mentions an oath sworn in the gate of the house of Tishpak. Chacham comments that this refers to a door of any ho house. Ibn Ezra comments that this was the city gates, as the judges tend to sit in them. Yeah, it probably would have been. It probably would have been uh, any house that owns a slave. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Once, once again, Sarna, just trying, uh, trying a little too, too hard, missing the. Point. I mean, yeah. if you're going before God, maybe it would have been a, a courthouse or something. Right, but the thing is, every uh, at that point, household gods were incredibly common. Uh, mm -hmm. Like the uh, there's this whole section in God, what was it? Was it Amos? Was oh, it? okay, see, so uh, I'm forgetting like the there. There's this whole passage about household gods, a whole chapter about it. Uh, oh, but yeah. It, well, forgetting. there's a whole. There are several sections in Judges, but they try and mm -hmm. write that off as everyone did what was right in their own eyes because there right. was no king. But I mean, you can wait, see wait, wait. You mean that morality was... is relative? <laughs> uh no no it's just that everyone was inherently evil because a rib woman uh was tricked by a snake to eat an unspecified fruit somebody can somebody corrected me today they said that i didn't know the facts because i i said that that that, that genesis says that snake that a snake can talk and they said that i don't know the facts um lawrence do i knew the fact do i know the fact that uh that snakes can talk they cannot talk yeah, but 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 the, the but genesis 3 says yeah. that a snake talked yeah it is it is more uh it is close it would be closer to a serpent but uh that that has that has theological so it could be a lizard <laughs> it has theological associations attached to it which is the important only if it. you but... watch the jack chick tract where it's like a weird ass man-sized lizard but with a cobra head that shit was weird as yeah, it loses well i don't know I've, I've been to the icr creation you know, the institute for creation <laughs> research oh. i've been to their museum here in dallas and you, you've really got to see the, their rendition of the they have these they have these different rooms you can walk into where they have these like they have bible stories depicted with uh like uh statues Dionys. and one of them is like this fiberglass rendering of a serpent. It 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 looks like a sleeve stack from the old 1970s Land of the Lost TV show. There is not it, enough it weed like, on it, Earth. <laughs> it looks like a reptilian humanoid. You know, like the beings from the Sirius Star System that have taken over the Illuminati and are in control of our government right oh, now. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what the one in the Jack Chick tract looked like. If you want to, you can go to the Chick Publications website. They have a creationist track where it literally has their version of the serpent. Basically, if a cobra 
turned into a man and stood up, but still had the hood and the weird tail because of reasons. Uh, but I, I think the important thing is that uh, the snake can't talk naturally. It can only talk um, magically. I'm, so, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting, but yeah. I think we're discussing Genesis 3 and not Exodus 21, and our oh, time is okay. is short. Yeah, yeah. And I have I a lot of commentary. And again, yeah, yeah. I apologize sincerely, but we need to it's stick okay. to the text. Wait, wait. Uh, we, need to, we need to hear you say the sentence. I not haven't finished yet. my commentary. <laughs> yeah, I haven't finished yet. I have not finished. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, pierce his ear with an awl. Uh, Talmud Kiddushin 22b gives a symbolic meaning for the piercing of the ear. It reads, Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai would expound this verse as a type of decorative wreath, i.e. as an allegory. Why is the ear different from all the other limbs in the body as the, hero, as the ear alone is pierced? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, The ear heard my voice on Mount Sinai when I said, For to me the children of Israel are slaves, Leviticus 25.55 which indicates, and they should not be slaves to slaves. And yet this man went and willingly acquired a master for himself. Therefore, let this ear be pierced. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me tell you something real quick. When I was a kid, when I was 20, when I was 20 years old, somebody, somebody told me that if you have your, your left ear pierced, it meant that you were gay. And if you had your right ear pierced, it meant that you were a drug dealer because that was 1982. <laughs> You know, and that's and that's the way people thought in 1982. And the funny thing was that I happened to know a gay drug dealer, and he didn't have either ear pierced. Oh. So as I am neither, I now I I now have two golden earrings. Mm -hmm. um, now on verse seven, I didn't add this to my notes, but I realized that maybe Aaron is interested. So Sana comments again: In the ancient world, a father driven by poverty might sell his daughter into a well-to-do family in order to ensure her future security. The sale presupposes marriage to the master or his son. Documents recording legal arrangement of this kind have survived from Nuzi. I'm curious why you said I was interested. Because you expounded on this very much on your reading. Okay. You did. Okay, gotcha. So I'm just dudes... saying I'm not in the market. I don't, you know, I'm happily married. I don't. <laughs> so like two months, like two months before this, these dudes are wiping blood on their doorposts to save yes. their firstborn. Yes. And now there's this law where if you want to become a lifelong slave for your master voluntarily, you put your ear up against this do this doorpost of the house that you want to serve and get pierced and and i'll nail you okay. to the wall literally yeah <laughs> and of course nobody has houses at this point because tents slaves. in the wilderness or well yeah they're all rich none of them are poor no one's selling themselves into slavery so no. the, the laws the laws really aren't that relevant uh, there are some interesting apologetics about why can this you imagine first, but yeah. can you imagine this we'll kind of culture where some... you can just I'm, I'll, I'll sell i i can't sell ivanka i love ivanka but i'll sell tiffany <laughs> i have to say um playing something of the devil's advocate marriage in those days was not really significantly different from selling your daughter into slavery because you were selling her into marriage you would get a bride price she would be the property of the new family. Uh, even in China, which compared to this area was very civilized, uh, Confucius is said to have claimed better a dog than a daughter because a dog will defend the house, but a daughter will leave it. Women as property. Ouch. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fucked up. But women as property has been so much of the story of humanity under patriarchy and we're really, really and sick of it but also that's the context in which this is being said which means that selling your daughter into slavery would mean she was a wife of less repute she would not quite have the social status within the home but if she produced heirs particularly male heirs that were healthy and strong she could still secure her life and mm -hmm her livelihood that was literally all she could do 
Yeah. Married um, above the her, her state status. Um, Tomer, uh, um, Tomer, what what were the rules pertaining to um, female slaves? Did they they didn't mention it in this chapter? But are they freed after six years as well? No. No, no they, it, they, it did uh, mention it. It did mention it in this chapter. Female slaves are not allowed to go. It implied that. I don't think that's true. Yeah. But, so the literal the literal reading does seem to imply that. Uh, but the if a man sells his daughter, he she is not to go free as the men slaves do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed with money. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith with her fucking her if he selects her for his son he must grant her the rights of a daughter if he marries another woman he must not deprive her of food clothing and marital rights yeah and the, if the he rules does are not... different uh, but i think the, the the commentary actually says that uh when it says uh, she should uh, go out not like the the men slaves it means the male uh can uh whatever the word is non-jewish slaves um which meant that like uh she wouldn't go out if she was injured well the thing is and that they're not, they're not going, going even the female slaves aren't yeah. going there to to for, for labor they're going for something yeah. else uh so it's not yeah it's not really those well it's like, kind of for labor sure but not in the same I mean, it culminates oh, labor in labor for us. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough, fair enough, fair enough. when Tomer finishes, I'm gonna do like a. I'll, I want to go over when Tomer finishes, sure, make it work. Yeah, so, we have yeah. comments to read as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. As it, that's fine. This is the the harder part. Yeah. Yeah. All right, do you want to read the comments, or should I finish my commentary? Uh I don't think you can finish your commentary, but I will. I will read them. Uh, Neil, the 604 atheist, says, uh, LOL, hey, uh, can't today because I'm at home currently. Got my show tonight to do. My bass player, Mike, is on. You know, I got to tell you, he he said, when are you going to invite me? I didn't, I, 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 we may have had this discussion where he said that he should be on. But, you know, that like, I've slept since then. I don't remember. <laughs> I put his, I, I, I sent him an invitation. He can join us anytime he wants. I'm going to include his email address in our regular listing so that he can join us every time he wants every time we do this if he wants mm -hmm. but he bitches that i didn't send him an invite and then when i do he said oh i can't make it okay <laughs> then eric wander <laughs> gifted five r and raw memberships Aww. then phobus says just want to confirm henotheism is when there are multiple gods but only one is worshipped or something along those lines. I don't think that's what yes. henotheism is. Yes. Yes, yes, it is. That is yes. what henotheism is. Yes, yes. this is. Next yeah. question. They, they, <laughs> they accept that multiple gods exist, but they on um, this is our god, and we only worship our god. This don't is our god. Our god is the best god. We only worship this god. All the other gods yeah. can eat dirt. Do you not worship gotcha. other gods before me? Yeah. And then Minute Rice uh, says, Aaron, maybe you should go get a snake and see if it talks." For science. <laughs> How many and at this point i'm gonna i'm gonna mention i i met minute rice for uh, a drink uh, at, a, at a local brewery and i just i don't know why i brought one of my one of my snakes i brought a i brought a classic uh boa constrictor imperator and minute rice fell in love with my snake and just informed me earlier today that because of that encounter minute rice has just bought a boa constrictor imperator <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay so Satan increases yes Hail and Satan. then da david muir says i'm curious was the hebrew practice of piercing a slave's ear unique to them or did other cultures cultures also mark a slave in that manner well i try I, from what i've read there aren't really extra biblical sources that indicate uh, such a manner of marking a slave. I know that there is a method called the abutum, which is a haircut that was given in Akkadian culture. But uh, beyond that, I don't really know. Yeah, I, it would make sense that it's unique if it's about Hebrew slaves shouldn't should go free. They shouldn't be slaves longer than necessary. I and I will. You know, they sorry. should only be slaves to God. So. You know, it's I, like I, a punishment for the slave. It's important to, important to remember that this is a sign of pride that this slave would have. Like, 
He's no. a bond servant. It's yes. a punishment. It's a punishment. He should it go out. It means that he loves no. his wife and children more than his freedom and has been forced to say that he loves his master and maybe even believe it. That is hey, if you ever want to see your kids again. I tell will me you love me and I, make I, me believe it. Did I'm, you I'm strike again, at me? I'm very Dude. sorry that I'm interrupting. I, I did this so many times, but I will mention that there is an article called His Master Shall Pierce His Ear with an All, Exodus 21.6, Marking Slaves in the Bible in Light of Acadian Sources by Victor Horwitz. I hope this will expound on somewhere. your answer. Okay. Admittedly, an earring is probably better than being branded. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Comments. Uh... Okay, so Nilly Wilson offers $20. Canadians, thank you very much. Says, Aaron, do you think someone can be considered a myth but also real? For example, you are the man, the myth, the legend. Keep up the great work. Uh, thank you. Will you stop that? You are not venomous. We don't he, care if you try to make me. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Aaron. Sorry. You are the star power. <laughs> I told you The before. snake was not talking to me. <laughs> I was talking to Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Thank you for the compliment. And then Minute Rice says, um, uh, I'm going to name my BZI Ghidorah because I'm a Godzilla nut and Ghidorah is my favorite besides the big guy himself. And he will be my only snake because I live in an apartment. Oh, you think he's going to be your only snake? <laughs> okay, let's see. BZI, Boa Constrictor uh, and Carousel? Yeah. Yes. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get a drink. Okay, I'll continue my commentary. On yeah. verse 10, uh, Hammurabi 148 reads, If a man takes a wife and she be seized by disease, if he then desires to take a second wife, he shall not put away his wife, who has been attacked by disease, but he shall keep her in the house which he has built and support her as long as she lives. And also, the Code of Lipid Ishtar 28 reads, If a man has turned his face away from his first wife, but she has not gone out of the house, his wife which he married as his favorite is a second wife, he shall continue to support his first wife. Why is Hammurabi more? Oh, wait, 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 wait. We we have somebody who's going to declare that he has a favorite wife. Yes. Oh, that's not gonna... oh yeah. Sorry. yeah. Don't yeah, you I'll... have You're a right. favorite wife, Arn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the snake. I don't have a choice <laughs> among them. <laughs> okay, I see how it is. I, I would suggest that you propound precisely why Lalandra is your favorite wife. <laughs> right now well actually um, I, I i can in fact i will say that my wife my 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 wife now is my favorite wife that i've ever had i can tell you that <laughs> and now i do have a choice and i'm being sincere <laughs> okay um her food um in hebrew it's she'era while most commentators interpret this to mean either food or meat and bdb it reads flesh the septuagint reads necessities and vulgate marriage so pick and choose. Um, marital rights, uh, Hebrew onata, which is a hapax. Most early translations, the Talmud, Ketuvot 47b, and most traditional commentators understood it to mean conjugal or marital rights. Reading onata as haonashela, her time, i.e. the times of cohabish, cohabitation. This interpretation, so however, this interpretation, however, does not have any philological support. Rashbam and Bechol show interpret dwelling or shelter, deriving it from the Hebrew ma'on, dwelling place. Another interpretation given by malul, oil or ointment, based on the three basic needs that a husband must give to his wife, food, clothing, and ointment, according to Hammurabi 178, Eshnunah 32, and Middle Assyrian Law 36. This triad also appears in the Bible, for example, Hosea 2.7 and Ecclesiastes 9, verses 7 to 9. Yeah, because ointment's important. Ointment is indeed important. I need to up my skincare routine, but uh, in oh, well, fairness, you skincare too. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been ointment originally, um, but um, then like there is a yeah, there is a Jewish uh, tradition that um, that a wife has like a right to the, the conjugal rights, which mm -hmm. means that if she wants sex, the husband has to give it to her, and there's like a whole thing about like. If you are a rich, nice. uh, if you're a wealthy man uh, who doesn't work hard, whatever, you have to do it once a day. Uh, if you're a worker, then it's once a week. If you're a merchant, it's once a month. But uh, yeah, it's 
It's I, it's supposed to put, like. I presume it, that's on average. In case the merchant is traveling, he has to make yeah. up for lost time when he comes back. Yeah, yeah, something um, like that. Yeah, but it's, it's, in he has fairness, an obligation to her, which is. I mean, there are cultures who will just blame women for all of sex and call us horny. But in reality, in this culture where a woman's only value and her only really a security is to produce sons for the family line and to produce children for the family line but particularly sons uh sex mm -hmm. becomes a, an absolute necessity that is literally her old age pension uh, right so, and withholding sex um and to stop her from from having any heirs would be seen as like uh, yes like yeah and that i maintain is the sin of onan not uh self-indulgence mm -hmm. but we'll get to that but eventually sure, yeah um, okay, Aaron, please read up to 25. Well, I, I, I just want to... No, no, okay, go do, on. Sorry. I, I wanted to just go over the, the laws as they are laws, like, because we just kind of read the literal translation. But, so more or less the... Just go quickly. So, um, uh, more or less a Jewish slave was someone that... Was, uh, or a Hebrew slave was someone who was so poor that he couldn't afford to live. He literally couldn't... He, even if he didn't have any clothes, like, nothing. Uh, then he was allowed to sell himself into slavery. The other way that a uh, Hebrew could become a slave was if he stole, was a thief, and could, didn't have any, he couldn't afford to pay uh, back what he had stolen. Then the courts would sell him and use the proceeds to pay the uh, for the theft. Um, a Hebrew slave would then be able to would then go free, um, either based on the amount that he was, you know, I, I'm going into slavery here is. We're going to sign a, 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 a document how long to go into slavery. So they'll either go slave at the end of that term or in the case of a thief, once the the amount that, to cover the, the, the cost was uh, how many years that was worth was over or after uh, the seventh year or there's a separate thing, which is like it's called the, the, the in English it's called the Jubilee. Actually, it comes from the Hebrew word Yovel, which is like, oh, yes. Um, and this was a thing that it's going to be, I think it comes down in Deuteronomy or whatever. Every 50 years, there's like a big celebration or whatever. And all slaves would go free, uh, regardless, of, regardless of how long they had left in their uh, contract or whatever. Uh, and debts were, were forgiven and stuff like that, whatever. That's so that was another way to go free. And then the other one, the master could uh, free him if he wanted to. And if somehow he came into money, he could pay off whatever he owed uh you know so like if you stole a hundred uh 300 uh zuzim and um uh you you uh, you you had worked one year you only had to pay 200 zuzim and then you could go free um i don't know exactly how you made money as a slave but i guess there were certain property rights that slaves did actually have um yeah uh blah 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 so yeah so if, if he uh a hebrew slave um, if he had like children or, or a wife, the master had to look after them as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it would have been, there were quite a lot of rules that, especially the Talmud brought in later saying like, if you had a Hebrew slave, uh, you had to like feed them the same quality food that you ate and all that stuff. And uh, so it was actually quite difficult to pay a slave owner. Sometimes you had to be quite rich and it wasn't a big mark of uh, where the status. Um, but a Hebrew slave could be married to a non-Hebrew slave woman, and this would have been so. Normally, that would be forbidden, uh, a forbidden relation. But within the when he becomes a slave, he kind of becomes like a quasi-Hebrew, and so certain rules aren't applicable to him. So he was able. So to, he's like, an unperson, and it's hoped that he'll be able to more clearly abandon the godless heathen wife goody yeah it's, it's when i gave my like testimony to the texas... his wife it's like the wife given to him yeah. when i gave my testimony to the texas state house on it, when they, they they wanted to post the 10 commandments in every you know, prominently in every texas classroom and when i gave my testimony on that somebody else was testifying on you know that that we should do that and the reason that he gave was that the 10 commandments he said were the basis of all Western morality. This, we're still talking about this list of commandments that began in Exodus 20, and we're now we're in Exodus 22, and this list is going to continue for a while. This 
is the basis of all morality. How we can hold a man's family ransom to enforce slavery on him and how Jews get preferential treatment over anybody else, even as slaves. Except, no, no, except true we believers. see this morality. Again, sorry, what? based no. on all the laws. <laughs> Isaac, we're, wasn't it normal for a slave, once he's freed, to be given um, a home and land and animals to live? There is, there is, there is a, a thing about when he goes free. If he he's male, maybe because that the, I will the female just gets booted right off now. into the wilderness. If I can have my home yeah, paid off in six years, I mean, sign me. There up. are supposed to be presents. I don't know about property and stuff like that, but um, not a yeah, home. I just, okay, let, let, uh, all right, so let me finish this quickly. So, uh, uh, yeah, so that's a Hebrew slave. So he comes in and out. Um, it means you can leave, and we won't hunt you down and kill you. Uh, yeah, so uh, a he so uh, so what is a Hebrew uh, slave woman? So a man, if he's completely destitute, uh, instead of selling himself, he could be, sell his daughter to uh, a rich person, and somehow so secure for herself, hit for her uh, a better life maybe, but also get a bit mm -hmm. of money out of it. Um, <laughs> as you were saying, it was it was a practice in the Near East at the time. Um, but one of the things I find pretty crazy about this, um, when you go through like the more legalistic texts and stuff, is this is actually talking about a child. It's not talking about a woman. It's talking about a girl between the ages of three and twelve. Um, mm -hmm. She belongs to her father at that point. Apparently, once she's above the age of twelve, he doesn't have rights to her. He doesn't get it in the sense that he he doesn't get paid money. Uh, so what does it mean exactly that we should not deprive a 12-year-old girl of her marital rights? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if that refers to... I think that refers Lilith, to if you, if you, she if becomes Lilith, if you find that wife. objectionable, if you find that objectionable, you should read the Quran. I think it's the Quran that we're, where it talks about how we can divorce children or you, ch children who have their their first or second divorce before they reach puberty uh well in, in fairness in islam ancestrally all you have to say is i divorce you to divorce someone to say divorce three times means you have divorced them three times and then you cannot remarry them until they re until they marry and have sex with someone else You'd be amazed what you learn about Islamic culture by reading the tales of Shahrazad, the original ones, not the watered down Arabian Nights version. But that's a whole nother world. Yeah, I just want to say that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Again, I just want to say we have 40 minutes left and I know that uh, Peter is short of time and I really. Want oh, to this we have the whole All section. Right. Of say this sentence, Tamara. Um, I haven't finished yet. No, I actually did finish this part. I actually did finish this part. You made me do this. I did yeah, just, this part. There is the whole uh, section left. So yeah, just yeah, go. You, you, you are read correct. from twelve to the end. Read it. Okay, read yeah, it. Hold on. Yeah, we'll go. Back. Hold on. Minute Rice Comment. says Lilith's facial expression. This episode is making it really captures how a lot of us feel about this awful chapter. <laughs> then Mighty Chicken says, "What you were talking about, Isaac, is not much different from our our penal system in a way." Low wages to pay off debt while being forced labor while in prison, not including the other horrors. If I guess it would be a replacement for that system because they didn't really have you know state run prisons. Uh, you, you would get like adopted by a family, and that was like this family would somehow make you better. And uh, but that yeah. is kind of one of the ideas, but yeah, I'm sure there are better ways to do it. In the Neither is, is ideal. I think yeah. we can do better. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to continue reading from what verse 12. 25. From 25, 25? up to 25, yes. Up to. Good. Oh, from from, uh, from 12 to um, 25. Yeah, yeah, Whoever yeah. strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. The fuck? We'll, we'll go on. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, I know. On, but there is a lot of unintentional manslaughter. You can kill someone accidentally. Sometimes the world is a fucked up place. Okay, but if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, 
You should take him from my author, my altar, that he may die. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. That's what it means when it says, honor thy father and thy mother that you will live a long life. Okay. <laughs> Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. And you're going to tolerate no horse thieves. Whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. Again, we go back to that fourth commandment. Remember the previous 10? Honor your father. When a man quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and the man does not die, but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoors without his staff, he who struck him shall be clear. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. Because vengeance is a thing that justice is concerned about. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged. For the slave is his money. When men strive together to hit a pregnant woman, so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose upon him, and he helped, he shall pay, as the judges determined. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and hand, foot for foot, hand for hand, and foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Okay, let's, when a man let's strikes the eye of his slave... Wait, 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 it's 25. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I was just uh, starting to get onto a roll there. I, I promise my uh, my commentary will be shorter than Tomer's. Uh, you don't, want to go you on, don't have Lawrence? to promise that. Yeah. We already know. Go, go on, Lawrence. Go on. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say my thing, and then we'll hop over to you. Uh, so <laughs> the, the first thing that Arn was wondering about, the place to flee. So I forget which tribe it was, but in... The Deuteronomistic history, if you were uh, accused of murder and you, know, the, you had a whole mob out to get you, there was a specific tribe you could go to. There was an area you could go to uh, basically just so you could await for trial where nobody could come and kill you. And I forget which one it was. But, uh, I don't know if it was a specific tribe. There were sanctuary cities were meant to be yeah. designated that you could run to. Yeah, uh, so the, the Avenger of yes, Blood, yes, who I, was a direct I do. family member, whatnot. Yeah. Um, again, I'm sorry, Lilith. I have the com. Uh, you meant my commentary is exactly what you mentioned. So I'm sorry. Again. Uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So which, which, the, which the one Levite was it? Cities, which were not. So the <laughs> Levites didn't have uh, a tribal area. So there were certain cities that spread throughout the land that were where they would live, and they were also cities of refuge. Okay. Yeah. So you could. Yeah, so you could run, you could run over there to to kind of you know basically await trial. Uh, and uh, before those were established, it's 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 possible that you would go to the altar and uh, and that would be a refuge, and that's why it says even from the altar, um, you'll be taken to be killed if you're uh, if you're if you didn't if you ambush someone. It strikes me a bit like sanctuary, the medieval practice of claiming sanctuary. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start my commentary now. Uh, 13, a place I will designate. According to Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy 4, verses 40 to 42, the place refers to cities of refuge. According to the Talmud, Makot 12b, this refers to the camp of the Levites, i.e. the place where the Levites resided near the tabernacle, according to Numbers 150. Sana mm -hmm. interpreted Makom as sacred site, a sanctuary from its Arabic cognate Makam. And now 14, Kasuto writes, it was a widespread custom both in Eastern and Western countries and accepted also in Israelite usage, uh, 1 Kings 2.28, that whoever entered a sacred place was saved from all punishment, even if he had killed a person willfully. The Torah abolishes this practice in the case of deliberate murder. The sanctity of the temple cannot override the sanctity of human life. 15. According to the Talmud, Sanhedrin 85b, a person that strikes his father or mother is not punishable with death except for a blow which causes harm, uh, causes a wound. Uh, similar. Okay. Uh, Hammurabi 195 reads, if a son strikes his father, his hands shall be hewn off. Which is fair. <laughs> uh, 16. Hammurabi 14. If... 
sorry, if anyone steal the minor son of another, he shall be put to death. And Hittite 19 reads, if a Luwian abduct a free person from the land of Hatti, and the abducted person's owner, i.e. the head of the household, recognizes him, the abductor shall bring, i.e. forfeit, sorry, forfeit his entire house. And Ibn Ezra comments, Sadiq Aon asks, why was this verse inserted between verse 15 and verse 17? He answers that scripture speaks only of the commonplace. Those stolen were young children. They were brought up in a strange country and did not recognize their parents. It is thus possible for them to strike and curse their parents. The punishment for this will fall upon the kidnapper. Now verse 17, Hammurabi 192 reads, if a son of a paramour or a prostitute say to his adoptive father or mother, you are not my father or my mother, his tongue shall be cut off. Which again is nice. According to the Mechilta, only a curse that mentions the tetra tetragrammaton, i.e. Yahweh, is punishable by death. Kasuto writes, the word Mekalel, curses, does not connote her here special cursing. S sorry, does not connote here specifically cursing. The original sanctification of the stem Kalal is the opposite of Kavad, with reference to weight. The former stem means to be light, the latter to be heavy. Also in the figurative state, the Sorry, in their figurative sense, the two stems are antonyms. Compare, for example, one se uh, First Samuel two thirty. For those who honor me, I will honor echabed, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Yekalu or Second Samuel six twenty two. I will make myself yet more com contemptible than than this. I shall be held in honor. Ikaveda. In Ugaritic text, the stem kalal is commonly found in parallelism with the stem kabad to denote the conduct of one who humbles himself and bows down before a great god and honors him. It appears, therefore, that this verse applies the term mekalel to one who commits an, any act contrary to the honor of his, parent, of his parents. Verses 18 to 19, Hammurabi 206 reads, If during a quarrel one man strikes another and wound him, then he shall swear, I did not injure him wittingly, and pay the fist and and pay the physicians. 20. He must be avenged. According to rabbinical tradition, this refers to the death penalty, specifically by decapitation, according to the Book of Education, Maimonides and Rashi. This interpretation is supported by the Samaritan text, he shall be put to death. 22. Similar laws regarding harming pregnant women are found in Hammurabi 209 to 204, Middle Assyrian laws 21 and 50 to 52, Hittite 1718. Uh, for example, uh, Middle Assyrian Law 21 reads, If a man strikes a daughter of a man and thereby cause her to abort her fetus, and they prove the charges against him and find him guilty, he shall pay 9,000 shekels of lead, they shall strike him 50 blows with rods, he shall perform the king's service for, for, one, for one full month. Uh, 23 to 25, the principle of Lex Talionis, an eye for an eye, began with Hammurabi, as seen from uh, 196, 197, and 200. If a man put out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. If he breaks another man's bone, his bone shall be broken. If a man knocks out the teeth of his equal, his teeth shall be knocked out. I'm done. Is, is the, did Wait, uh, Aaron this? read 26 and 27? No, no, he didn't. Go yeah. on. What did, yeah. what did um, you say about I finished um, this part. I did this. Great job. Like, Yay! <laughs> Yeah. Homer got his commentary. <laughs> and oh. for this part, there is also another part. Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, Tomer, believe... just just so that there is no confusion, I do sincerely appreciate your contributions to this show. Yeah, I, I, I don't you. want to seem. Yeah. I don't want anybody to think that I was being disrespectful at all. No, we tease you out of love. We named our. Uh, <laughs> we named our team. Our our um. At the Bible study team. Yeah. Yeah. Our, answering questions <laughs> yeah we named our team after you we love okay. you and you provide so much and i do think it's important to note that at this time things were still a bit primitive and you could absolutely ratchet up things by you know taking vengeance in excess and then end up with clan wars that would go on for generations and you have the Alistairs and the McCoys killing each other forever and ever and ever all men and nobody can remember how it started but you know so that the idea of just equal justice punishment is good in principle um and yeah it totally yeah, sounds like it but but let, let's think heard... about an eye for an eye making the whole world blind. Yeah, I do have yeah, exactly. two comments about that one and that one one of them is very important. So in we have a, a we have a, a, a early on it says if one injures a party um so where is it? Uh yeah, when two people parties quarrel and one strikes the other with stone or fist and the victim does not die but has taken to bed, he has to pay for uh he has to pay for the the 
idleness, not being able to work, and also for curing. So uh, the commentators, or at least the tradition, uh, uh, take from this that when it says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's not, it doesn't mean uh, literally as in you should put out an eye if someone puts out an eye, uh, which I guess maybe that is what Hammurabi was saying, but more uh, the value of, a, of an eye for the value of an eye. So uh, monetary compensation for an injury based on, uh, I think they calculated it based on like if this was person was sold on the slave market, how much would they have been worth before the injury and how much they would have been worth after the injury. And then the difference would have been the, 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 the compensation. Um, uh, and the other comment was uh, with the with the a pregnant woman. So this is very interesting um, verse because it it, it shows how uh, a fetus isn't considered the same as a as a person because it doesn't say that if uh, the woman miscarriages, you are put the person who hits her is put to death. Um, always treated in the same way as a person who causes an accidental death. It says. Uh, if there is a miscarriage, if the uh, if uh, in the case of a miscarriage, uh, accidental mi miscarriage, if the woman dies, then it's a death penalty. But if she doesn't die, then it's just a fine. Um, mm -hmm. So this shows that the, it's the. Uh, this is implying that the uh, the miscarriage isn't isn't um, isn't considered. So you mean, according to the Bible, a fetus yes. or zygote is not equivalent in value to a full human life. Oh, but we're there, good there. There are, there are, there are, there are, there are other things like commentaries, or whatever. Let's talk about like, you know, it's Wait, not a there's second. no They're death penalty, but it is still considered an evil thing to uh, to cause a voluntary um, involuntary uh, miscarriage. No, yes. no, I'm saying for for a person nope. to for a woman, for example, to uh, cause herself to have a um, a uh, what's it called uh, an abortion an abortion, but for not for like non medical reasons. Um, mm -hmm. That was considered a, a bad thing to do. You shouldn't do that. Um, no, we'll, we'll get there. But it's also on the same yeah. level as like a seminal emission as well. Like you shouldn't do that. Yeah, so. yeah. Pete, you, you, you had a question? Yeah, isn't it referring to the kid in the womb though? Are you sure? Well, it's not a kid, it's is it? It's a fetus and you're not yeah, obligated to die if you kill the fetus, yeah. but you do pay yeah. a fine for the pain and yeah. suffering caused. Yeah, yeah, yeah Pitan, the thing yeah. to remember here is that in Hebrew tradition, the fetus was from conception until the first 45 days, it was considered only water. The fetus was classified as water for 45 days. And then after that, from, from the 45th day until birth, it was considered a limb of the mother, and specifically the thigh. And that's going to be important later on. Absolutely. There is a discussion. There is there is discussion mm -hmm. in like Talmud or wherever if if non Jews are allowed to uh, according to like the Noahide laws, uh, would they be allowed to uh, have caused themselves a voluntary uh, miscarriage or not? Whether it was considered, um, you know, liable to lashing or whatever, if it was considered a sin at all. Um, and so definitely for for a Jewish person, it was considered a sin to kind of stop. Um, um, and a, uh, stop a pregnancy uh, for non-medical reasons. Yeah, for non-medical reasons. But obviously, yeah. if, until if we get to a, numbers five. Well, yeah, if there's a medical well, reason, then they are, then they have to. So a medical well, this or wasn't a, a, this isn't a medical to. reason, but as a, but again, we'll, we'll we'll get there in due time. I want to appreciate that Tomer was trying to read really fast, and so he did really good. He, he's he he knows what we're what we've still got facing us, and we're less than a half hour now, and. And some of us have to, and I know that, that Peter has to go. He has got a hard quit. So we've got to get through this. Charlie yeah, Melanie. Yeah. Uh oh, uh, I wanted to make a comment on the verse seven. No, yeah. 15 and 17 on cursing your mother and, and uh, or father being put to death for that. And, and there's some dispute over whether Jesus agreed with that. In the New Testament, like the Pharisees, they in Mark, uh, it's Mark uh, five through nine, uh, chapter seven. Uh, they they were criticizing him because he was eating without washing his hands, 
and he said y'all y'all are hypocrites because and he's he, y'all are hypocrites because that's how jesus talked <laughs> i know anyway <laughs> So he said, and, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me in vain. Do they worship me teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men? You leave the commandment of God and hold on to the tradition of men. And what he was referring to, he said, he said, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your mother and father, father and mother, sorry. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God. Then you can, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his, fa his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. So was God, was Jesus, <laughs> was Jesus saying uh, that uh, he agreed with the law that if you curse your mother and father, that you should surely die and but the, what the, it's saying there was this there was this weird thing where some people would uh take their money and give it to the temple and then they would then there there then they wouldn't have to support their mother and father so it would it, thing. You're, you're i guess a hypocrite. they could buy their way out of the duty of care yeah um and i i say this as someone who loves their parents and who has sacrificed a great deal to be there for them in their times of need. There are parents who do not deserve that. And there are parents who do, and you have to ultimately, you know, people are making the choice to protect their own peace, but to give back to those who raised you is, you know, that absolutely makes sense as a moral precept. But again, it's, Life is complicated. And, they and some they parents would, deserve to be cursed, frankly. So they, so they would use these religious laws to get out of their duty to their mother and their father. Yeah. I think so. Thank you for that, Lalandra. Almost like indulgences. I'm going to read a couple more comments. Charlie Malinay said, I had a pastor point to this very chapter to say that the Bible was against slavery for having the thou shalt not kidnap bit. Did he really think I wouldn't read the rest of this chapter? Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Then Trevor Wright says, R and Ra, you are the GOAT, G-O-A-T. Thanks for your courage and bravery to speak the truth, which some aren't willing to do. I enjoy watching your videos on creationism and evolution as well. Uh, thank you very much, but I just I feel really weird about getting compliments, especially when I have when I have to read it like that. I appreciate it. But I, but getting the compliment makes me feel like I didn't deserve it. Yeah. I Are you sure you're not a little Canadian? No. <laughs> <thing> Sorry. Is, <laughs> the thing is, I feel the same way because, uh, like, if if I here here's how it works in my in my fucked up head, and Arn maybe it works that way in yours. But when I get uh, a compliment, if if I uh, internalize that then that gives me a reason to become complacent and I don't want to be complacent. I want to keep getting better. So get, getting compliments is very uncomfortable. Yeah, I, want to talk about, I want to talk about verse 22 real quick because I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Hmm. Isaac, you said that it's referring to the woman if the woman dies, but I think it's talking yes. about the baby. No, because no. the, the beginning is if there's a miscarriage. Yeah, in, and then, so yeah, that's... and nagfu ishahara, which means pushes a pregnant woman. Nagaf means to push. Yeah, it so says, uh, let me... and a miscarriage results. If she yeah, miscarries, but her, there her is no serious out, yeah. injury. Referring so... to the referring to the child. No. If that if she if if the child is fine, there's still a punishment, but it's not as severe. If the child is dead and dies and then the guy who did that to the woman is to be put to death that's no not interpretation that's not what it says the child that's what comes you would out, like it bruised, to say. i should say we have our man. time is short so we need to make it quick yes. well, well, uh, come here. we need it we need a hebrew translation here okay so the hebrew says um oh well, that settles it then <laughs> uh, it says yeah i'm just gonna say it says that if he hits a woman 
a pregnant woman and the and the child goes out so there is a miscarriage yeah the miscarriage mm -hmm. yes that's the beginning of the, of the of if the, the child comes thing. out of her, and the, yeah, the, the, the not a son, and there yet. is no, is, no, no it, if it is it's a not, miscarriage if they hit the woman and the child dies yes that's 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 there is what no it injury that's what it means birth prematurely but if you okay if, if you collide into someone if you collide into a pregnant woman it's not going to be like, oh, here's a premature birth. It's probably going to result in a child's death. The fetus will die. This is no. this is absolutely not the reality, especially in that day and age. Birth. Causing I a think premature the interpretation birth is, wrong. is a bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an abortion. That's what they're talking about is an involuntary miscarriage. And remember, you're talking about this from the perspective of we have modern hospitals and ICUs and a team of nurses and surgeons and blah, 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 blah. Yes, in some of those cases, we could occasionally save the premature baby. In ancient Israel, no the fuck you couldn't. They would be dead. That's not even a question. Yeah, you could you could twist it to People say if the baby premature. goes out and survives, versus if the baby goes out and and dies. But um, as, 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 as like all of the that's not what is it, it not in the, the Hebrew thing you're interpreting saying, it wrong. The, the thing is, it would be uh, it would Clearly be really weird for the them to have any potential punishment for causing a premature birth. Uh, th right. Since these are uh, since we're talking about uh, uh, some in, ca in some cases we're talking about murder some. Case we're talking about like you know uh, accidental death you know manslaughter stuff like that since we're talking about it in that context the uh the understanding of the fetus coming out means that there's a miscarriage so in the mm -hmm. case that there is a miscarriage and no other serious damage has happened or yeah uh or altered you still pay a fine yeah so you, there's still a penalty but uh if if the mother other than that is okay then it's not going to be death but if the mother dies in the process, there's going to be a death. Absolutely, because yeah, and if the, right. the mother is a person, the kid, sorry. and yeah, also that, no, that is not. that is the common interpretation of this verse, by the way. Town, you're is ignoring people who speak Greek and Hebrew, telling you you're wrong. Well, to be fair, I didn't check the Greek. To be fair, but telling <laughs> you you're wrong. We're not. Well, I mean, the, the problem is if, if we're if, not either talking. We're not talking about either the fetus or the woman we're talking about the law that it applies to both of them so if the mother dies then the person that caused the death will die if, the, are, oh, if the fetus is lost then there's a, there's then a there's fine. you have to pay something right what are you paying what are you paying for if the if the child goes out and there is no damage as you say meaning that the child doesn't die then what is the no, no no but by no damage the talking about no damage to the woman Yes, yes, but um, yeah. but the, but the, but the, the child goes that out, meaning that, it, that the baby didn't die. If I'm reading this right, and I don't know, I don't know the Hebrew, but I, in the English translation, pregnant the, woman in causing in the English translations, birth. the implication is the fetus has been aborted. It, it, it results in a miscarriage, but the woman yes. survives. Yes. Then there's then there's no significant penalty, and you, you have a fine. But if the but if the fetus but if the woman dies, then there's a fine. No, this is or a there, different then it's life for life. Humanism and Christianity. Who is the person in this situation? The woman or the half-developed fetus? You guys are forgetting the, the, the whole point is why would it even mention that she's pregnant if it has nothing to do with the child? Because he still has notice, a fine. He has to no, pay a fine if he causes yeah, a notice this. Notice this. Yeah. There's a fine because it's a loss to, and the fine is paid to the husband for the loss of his potential child uh, because there was val monetary value in having children because if it was a son, they help you to uh, do labor. A daughter, may, maybe... Um, you could make a, a nice marriage thing. Uh, a you could sell her to somebody else. Yeah. And to, yeah. And to add As to that, yeah, the, 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 the fine was calculated based on the value of the wife before uh, being pregnant versus being having uh, having an abortion. So again, exactly. I'm sorry so that I'm interrupting. More monetary yeah. value. Yeah. I think I'm sorry that I'm interrupting section. again, but the, we have yeah. a quarter of a time here. We need to finish with the. All right, everybody, letter. respect Tomer actually... and speak as quickly as he does. Sometimes I feel okay, like read, there's, there's a little <laughs> bit of push and pull with like. <laughs> I think that Sometimes... you guys are wrong, but I just I think this is a bad time to let you know that we're having a baby. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Well, well, well congratulations. I mean, that's why I'm a little emotional about it. Yeah. yeah. No, well, we're, we're I not hope, wrong. I hope it's and there are you. other. Crash, we're not wrong, and there's other aspects of the Bible w- that will confirm that we're not wrong about this. But there's also Talmudic. Tra- uh, there's also Talmudic tradition, which also confirms that we're not wrong about this. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we you don't wish all the all be well for right. your wife and baby. I feel like there's. Well, like- you, you know, it's written by the same people, right? Mm, so for context, not quite. Not quite. Uh, what, guys, you think it please. Was, you think yeah, it was Russians that wrote section? the Talmud? Okay, can we just rush through the end of this chapter before Tomer has an aneurysm? No, <laughs> I, I feel like there's like a push and pull for the limited amount of time that we have. One, to say what the sages said about the Bible, which is kind of the scholarly thing, which is important. And the other is the cultural aspects of what impact this has on, on, on reality. So, like, I think it's equally important to for people to not misunderstand the context and the history of what this verse that they're arguing about let, is about. Let me let me offer this. Let me let's do a let's do a separate show, entirely separate show, you know, uh, on the Bible's position on abortion, and we'll have we'll, we'll have the same people on. We'll do just do a whole separate show about it. And Tomer would be very important. No, and, and no, I, I'm, I'm, I want to stick important. on blasphemous Bible, please. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Tomer and and I, I'm, I'm input sorry, on what what the Hebrew says. On what the, no, Tomer, let's do it. On what the Hebrew. No, no, we're not going to do it joking, now. So we're not going to do it now. We'll do it. We'll do it at another time. I, I, I don't know. If you want to. I don't know. Maybe I'm stressed out right now. Please finish this. I don't want Peter <laughs> yeah. to lose okay. his mind. Tomer loves baby. Everybody respect Tomer. Let's get through this. Finish it. Uh, who reads? Do you want me to read? 20... Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, when a 26. man strikes this the eye of the slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let him go free uh, on free on account of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox is not to be punished. If, however, the, that ox has been in the habit of goring and its owner, though warrant, has failed to guard it, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner too shall be put to death. If ransom is laid upon him, he must pay whatever is laid upon him to redeem his life. So too, if it scores a minor, male or female, the owner shall be dealt with according to the same rule. But if the ox scores a slave, male or female, he shall pay 30 shekels of silver to the master, and the ox shall be stoned. When a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or an ass falls into it, the one responsible for the pit must take restitution. He shall pay the price to the owner but shall keep the dead animal. When a man's ox injures his neighbor's ox and he dies, they shall sell the the live ox and divide its price. They shall also divide the dead animal. If, however, it is known that the ox was in the habit of goring and its owner has failed to guard it, he must restore... he must restore ox for ox, but shall keep the dead animal. When a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Now my commentary. Verse 26. Kasuto writes in section 199 of the... <laughs> Homer, Homer, stop! Homer, stop! Bring your mic a bit closer. Stop! No, I, I'm sorry. Him, I'm so frustrated. Let him go. Let it. Let him go. No, we're, we're in chapter 22, according no, to No, no, we're not in chapter 22. No, 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 he's not continuing. Oh, he's go this is like, the yeah, this is like the, 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 the different um, verses. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I spent been, yeah, yeah. six years studying these these last few verses you were just reading. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Gore, I'm just saying uh, if we... Goring and I, 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 I want to wide. hear Tomer sigh a breath of relief that he finished his commentary. Let him go. Oh, he hasn't started it yet. <laughs> yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> Okay, verse 26, Kasuto writes, in section 109 of the Hammurabi Code, it is written that if a man destroys the eye of another man's, another man's slave, he shall pay his master half the price of the slave. A similar penalty is prescribed in the Hittite Law, section 8, for one who strikes another man's slave. In neither of these two codes is anything said with regard to one who blinds the eye of his own slave. Apparently, they did not ordain uh, any punishment for such person, in addition to the loss he caused himself by reducing the value of his slave. But the Torah took pity on the slave. If his master strikes the, his eye and destroys it, the assailant shall be punished in that his slave shall go free for nothing. Now, verses 28 to 32. Eshnuna 54 to 55 and Hammurabi 250 to 252 deal, deal with the same topic. For example, Eshnuna 54 
255 reads, if an ox was a gore and the authorities ha have had it made known to its owner, but he did not guard his ox and it gored and killed a man, the owner of the ox shall, pay, shall weigh out two-thirds of a minash silver. If it gored and killed a slave, he shall weigh out 15 shekels of silver. Now, verses yeah. 35 to 36. Eshnuna 53 reads, if an... Oh, I didn't read this. If an ox gored and killed an ox, both owners shall divide the prize. Like, yeah, it, uh... No, I didn't read this. Okay. Uh, 35 to 36. If an ox gored and killed an ox, both owners shall divide the price of the live ox and the carcass of the dead ox. And 35. Savage Ibn Ezra. Ben Zuta says that Re'ehu and others is an adjective describing the ox. However, Ben Zuta did not notice that the word show ox is in the context with ish, mans. This is also the case with the word show ox and Re'ehu and others. However, an ox has no friend, Re'ah, except for Ben Zuta. I'm done. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's quite savage. Okay, so Tomer. that's what sigh of relief sounds like. Tomer, yeah. my sweet, my darling, my love, would you be so kind as to provide a bibliography for us that we might perhaps, perchance, put in the comments or the uh, description of the video? Just as a thought. You're speaking much too slowly, mm. Lilith. <laughs> I apologize. I will speak more quickly. Please give us a list of references I, I, at some future time, but to Peter, but later. Don't worry about it now. Also, good job. Thank and you. I think Thank it's you. important to note that everything here is being delineated by some monetary value because we're talking about oxen and slaves, of course. Um, but it, there's obviously it's important to lay out a specific value for these things. And it seems to be reasonably fair minded in regard to how much fault could be laid on a person. Did they know it was a dangerous animal or no, etc.? Yeah. I'm um, going to blame was, Peter sorry. for having a hard quit on this. <gasps> this this chapter deserved more discussion. I I did <laughs> we didn't need to see Tomer like this, and yeah. I got to finish these comments. So Minute Rice, Tomer. Minute Rice uh, says, "Aaron, we should start by borrowing from. Should we start from borrowing by Jimmy's playbook and tell you to go fuck yourself? No, just tell me, Aaron, fuck off. That's that's fine. I'll take it as a compliment. Then Hope, Homo Sap, Hobo Sapiens says, "We love you, Tomer." Thank you. And then Tsunami uh, says, Tomer, you must fight the good fight. And he Thank is. He I will is. say that I wanted to I, I wanted to include the bibliography uh, when we finish Exodus, but uh, maybe I'll uh, put in the comments or maybe I'll I send I'll send R and Mike uh, bibliography for the things that I say. Mm -hmm. I will arrange okay. it. Oh, you know, right now, I, I don't mean to be the voice of like dissent here, but does anybody anybody of us here besides Isaac who studied this for six years remember anything about the commentary mm -hmm. about the oxes and the like I do it's complete realistic it's it's like yeah it's very dry the only idea the only thing is like a person is liable for the damage that he causes even if it he doesn't do it directly and um and you're responsible to control your animals, but within yeah. reason, if your an property, animal acts yeah. out of character, that's different than if the animal has been known to behave poorly and you have not taken the responsibility to control it. Honestly, in many ways, this is obviously a more ancient and, you know, yeah. primitive yeah, Jewish, version. Jewish, Jewish people definitely learn about this stuff a lot more. And I can, under I can understand that like Christians probably, probably were like, that's in the Bible? But the premise is very reasonable. The premise of, yeah. you know, reasonable yeah. amount of responsibility. How much could you reasonably have predicted? Did you take responsibility for something that you knew about or not? Or is this just something random and out of left field? That kind of thing. And putting monetary values on it is, frankly, downright American. This is where I would argue that Tomer's commentary is, in, is, is important. And it's particularly when we have disputes about what the Hebrew says or what the culture actually meant, mm. but the context is also important. You can't you have By to bringing have up the Hittite laws, uh, showing how similar it is to the cultures around them. Yeah, uh, is one of the it, big especially things. Especially Ashnuna fifty three, which is very similar to verses thirty five to thirty six. Yeah, it show, it shows that these are not divine laws. These are the laws of the land. People took them for granted, and it was you know, put in as God divinely ordained, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So for, I'm going to, I'm going to ask that we do, yeah. I'm going to ask that we close it up now so that we can give Peter five minutes to go to his next show. Hopefully <laughs> Peter will, 
Hopefully, Peter will not like have another hard hard and stop. And hopefully, you won't this have deserved, your Saturday off. This this deserved some further discussion. It did. I mm -hmm. fully take the blame for having to do some some other thing for where, where we're doing this this off day thing. I apologize for that. I I feel I've disrespected my my, my co-host. Arn, I have, um, yes. Uh, to to do something in return. I'll be more than happy to host that uh, that extra show that you have planned on this chapter as well. <laughs> God, so, fuck you, Lawrence. So <laughs> we we need to what? pick a, a day, day and sport. time for that. I'll tell you what he does. He, he sent Discord for better help for <laughs> me. <laughs> oh God. Okay, I was not kidding about the the Bible stance on on abortion. And everybody, everybody's here. And, and other, I will take it. I will take other people who are interested in participating in that one. But I'd like to dedicate it. I'll least bring an my hour. Stuff, concordance. Yeah. There's now we can do that. that. At, we can do that at a different time. We can. We'll discuss this in email after. Uh, you know, contact it. Contact us. Uh, go. Go through. Go through Peter. You know, going to go for it. Uh, Gmail dot com. If you if you want to be on in, in on that show because I think it's important. It matters. We should do it. Info at going to go for it. Be involved in that. Arn, that's I, I, info okay. at gonna go for it dot com. Not, not Gmail. There you go. Yeah. And come join us on the Discord to talk about the, the finer details of how much a shekel is worth and yeah. you know, what yeah. type of oxen. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll One fifth of a more woman. details there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's gonna All be right. some fun battles. Okay. Mwah. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye okay. bye everybody. Make sure you join the Friday show tomorrow. See you guys. <laughs>